Let me start with the outline of this lecture. The lecture is called Classical Fields, and indeed, we won't talk much about quantum mechanics, and I will explain why. Everything has an explanation. Classical fields. Um, if it were a um, standard course on advanced quantum mechanics, at this place of the course, we would quantize electric field. That's usual way of education. Uh, it's good if you kind of look at fundamental problems at uh, the structure of the universe. Uh, for us, uh, it's a bit different. We would like to understand more things. Uh, that's why I will start with a message. And the message is that Almost everything which you, uh, which you see in nature is a sort of field. And uh, almost any field which you can see, one can present, let me jump here, as a set of harmonic oscillators. One does it with electromagnetic field, but eventually one can do this with any field, almost any field which you can imagine. Everything which is described by linear equations in physics, small deviations, Taylor expansion, equations are also linear. Everything can be seen as a set of independent harmonic oscillators. So I don't know whether you get this message uh, earlier in your education, but I guess it's very important for all the physics, all the knowledge we have, so I will repeat it. That's why we will start our considerations with a bit uh, strange systems. Chain of springs, elastic spring. Simple convenient systems we can understand at least the classical level very neatly. And uh, right, I will uh, show you that it's uh, nothing but, but a set of harmonic oscillators. Right, then we still have to work with the electromagnetic field, it's still important in the nature. So we go through Maxwell equations, through vector and scalar potentials, which is uh, very specific for electromagnetic field, gauges, uh, right, we will talk about interaction, and we will uh, basically, as a, a closer to the end of this lecture, we will look at general solutions of Maxwell equations. And again, we will show that the electromagnetic field is a set of harmonic oscillators. Right. We will talk about field in general and we will conclude with a, a little example. The simplest example which one can get with an oscillator just a circuit which is made from capacitor and inductance where there is a single oscillator mode, we will understand that it also falls into this general scheme. Fine, that was introduction. And I wonder, was it uh, too long, too short, or just normal? Would you give me some response? Nobody says it's too long. That's nice. I also. So thank you for encouragement. Uh, let me go on. Let me repeat this message. I have already told you in short. Sir, so in order to map for the message to get through, let me first define what is a classical field right 
Sir, uh, it is a physical quantity which is defined in space and time. So that can be three dimensional space and over time. Uh, right, it could be, for instance, an electric field from some moving objects, which is defined in each point of space and time. Uh, electric field is a uh, vector field. One can Consider, for instance, uh, water, ocean, three-dimensional steel, and there will be uh, two fields characterizing it. There will be pressure, which is scalar field, and also local velocity of water inside three-dimensional. If you look at the surface of a pond, doesn't make sense to think about it as a three-dimensional object. One can introduce a field. What would be a proper field? Just think a second how one would characterize the motion of water in a pond. All right, I would say it's just local height of water, which will depend on two coordinates. Let me call it X and Y, and also on time. So all these things are examples of a classical field. So just a quantity which is not uh, local, which is not single. It's a plenty of uh, closed quantities which are uh, set in a space to three one dimensional in time right then i would assume it's not really crucial assumption that can be sorted out but not quite we will talk about this about dissipative quantum mechanics um but i would assume no dissipation so energy is conserved at least approximately in course of uh, the field evolution which becomes then a case of Hamiltonian dynamics. One can describe everything with a, a classical Hamiltonian equations. Basically, it's Newton mechanics, but just set in a convenient form of a Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian is energy in uh, classical mechanics. Right, from that one can get time dependent equations uh, which uh, would define an evolution of a field configuration. So, that for instance, I put it like this A states for arbitrary, arbitrary value, uh, arbitrary index A depends on uh, coordinate and space. And, uh, right, we will, uh, if you know Hamiltonian dynamics, we can derive uh, time-dependent equations, evolution equations, which uh, define uh, evolution of the field. And for electromagnetic field, you know how these equations are called. Those are Maxwell equations. Right. Uh, Maxwell equations are, well, in approximation, we know them. In that approximation, Maxwell equations are linear automatically. There could be more complex dynamical systems where dynamics is not very linear. Anyway, if you're talking about small deviations of fields from equilibrium value, we can linearize those. We can linearize them and we bring them to a standard form again for any field from what I considered from any field which I have not considered. Uh, well, um, we can all present it as a set of independent oscillators, which is a bit boring and 
rather disappointed disappointing uh, for instance you can sit by a pond look at the surface of uh, water the weather is fine sun shines and you see quite some beauty looking at uh, small waves at the surface of this pond nevertheless it just set off independent harmonic oscillators which is perhaps boring message but if we know that we can easily quantize these fields we can actually get to the roots of advanced quantum mechanics so that's the reason we do so it becomes uh, the basis of the quantization and we will quantize again all the fields uh, all uh, fields uh, which um, uh, obey linear equations in, in the next lecture. Uh, let us see. So uh, we are talking about classical fields in general. I gave some examples. Who can give me an example which I did not give? An example of classical field. So we can see whether uh, we understand the concept. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, it is, uh, you can say it without hesitations, Ludwig. Um, uh, there are gravitational waves. So it's also difficult to detect. Some people still doubt that they exist, but well, so there's no reason they, they don't. Uh, gravitational waves also an example of uh, independent harmonic oscillators. Provided they are linear, there is no shock, there is no big bang collapse. The gravitational waves which we can observe are linear waves. Another example. Doesn't come post. Magnetic, yeah, but it's a part of uh, electricity and magnetism. They always come together. Acoustic, precisely, precisely. Uh, thank you, Mohammed. Uh, shock waves, uh, Ludwig. It's a, uh, yeah, it, atmosphere. Or, or uh, let me um, talk about shock waves separately. Uh, as to acoustic waves, yes, it's excellent uh, example. Everything which we hear is an acoustic wave and yeah it's also if you neglect dissipation it's a set of independent harmonic oscillators um, uh, is acoustic different from pressure and velocity field if you consider acoustic waves in a liquid or uh, in um, air there's no difference. In solids, acoustic waves are different, a little bit different because of elasticity, because of possible uh, anisotropy for uh, acoustic waves in uh, uh, solids. Uh, one rather uses displacement of atoms as a uh, Field variable. It's better than just pressure and um, uh, velocity uh, because the atoms are arranged in the lattice. We will look at the, at the chain um, uh, of atoms uh, in no time. Uh, uh, coming back to your uh, suggestion, Ludwig, uh, shock waves. Uh, those are essentially nonlinear waves. So one cannot actually treat them as we, as we uh, do with other waves, with small deviations. Shock waves require concentrated, um, to put it uh, bluntly, an explosion, right, which uh, is uh, strong 
deviation from equilibrium, so resulting wave is not a linear wave. I cannot readily describe it as a set of harmonic oscillators. Uh, yeah, Ludwig has a question. Uh, can shock waves can be quantized as well? Yes, uh, the question is, um, is uh, the answer is, is uh, positive. Uh, you, do, you can quantize shock waves. Uh, what are, if it's practical, if it uh, corresponds to any physical problem, we can assess it's a separate question, uh, but one cannot quantize this shock base with a method I'm going to describe. So everything is consistent. A strong nonlinearity, uh, this is something which uh, makes equations nonlinear, and uh, that cannot be done is a method of independent oscillators. Fine, very good. So let me go, uh, go on. Let me uh, take a simplest example. I kind of got convinced that uh, all fields are about the same. So I can take any simple example I can imagine and elaborate on this simplest example and we understand how any field can be quantized. We will see similarities, for instance, with what I am going to show and with the quantization of electric field. Right, so I set a chain of sprints. Let's set better highlight. Uh, and uh, there are small balls. which are connected by springs. So springs by themselves don't have any mass. These uh, balls do have mass. Uh, all right, so kind of uh, everybody can, um, can uh, imagine how to make the system with your hands. Uh, I could find a video, but yeah, I, um, I didn't have time in the morning. Very good. So why we do, sir? Because we can easily figure out what is the energy, what is the Hamiltonian of this system. Let us see. There are balls and they have kinetic energy. Momentum squared for each ball and labels the balls. Well, div divided by two, we assume that all masses are the same. Uh, otherwise, equations would be too... Otherwise, linear equations, uh, they're simple, but they're, we won't be able to write um, a general solution that quickly. Good, and uh, there is a potential energy presented by springs with a elasticity constant k and uh, I assume hook law which says that the uh, elastic energy in springs is proportional to the square root of the relative deviation. Good. So what are axes here that I put here? Axes are positions of the balls counted from their, uh, their, uh, their uh, equilibrium positions. Equilibrium comes here. Uh, right. So elastic energy, hook law. Elastic energy depends on coordinates. Uh, kinetic energy depends on momentum. Right, so we have a Hamiltonian, which is a function of many momenta, many, many, 
coordinates. But that does not uh, really make a problem too difficult. Uh, let me perhaps zoom into reflections. Oh, it's getting a bit messy. Anyway, we can manage. So having Hamiltonian, we can derive equations of motion. Here it is. Whatever the Hamiltonian, the time derivative of x is the derivative of Hamiltonian with respect to pi. For our case, as promised, there is a linear equation. For any Hamiltonian, time derivative of uh, momentum, each momentum, is Martin's coordinate derivative of the Hamiltonian which is in our case is that. Uh, if one looks attentively at this expression, one understands that this is a difference of force, forces which act on the ball N from its neighbors which have indices n plus one, n minus one. Difference of uh, elastic forces coming from this hook law. Oh, well, very good. Um, the question is simple. We can immediately exclude momentum from our consideration. We can simplify the questions. Uh, how we do this, we just differentiate it with respect to time. Uh, let's see, I will add another derivative with respect to time here. And that's gonna be d, p, d, t. But I know what it is. So I can just immediately substitute it here, right? Uh, let me uh, arise what I have at the board. Uh, right. So we end up with a second order equation, second order in time derivative, linear equation. Uh, how to solve this? Uh, right, in uh, that respect, I would perhaps appeal, and I don't know whether I may, to your course of uh, solid state physics. In fact, such Equations can be solved with a method which uh, I believe has been described for you in solid state physics. So, in fact, equations are Bloch waves. Does this ring a bell for anybody who can recognize in this equation? Yeah, okay, good. You took uh, to solid state physics very well. Let me shortly uh, yeah, block waves yeah can be used yeah, used uh, used everywhere. But anyway, let me. Uh, it's good that you know this. Let me shortly uh, 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 remind you how does it go. In fact, Xn can be thought as a wave. So dependence on N and on T is entirely in this, uh, in this phase factor, right? X is, uh, X is uh, real. So one needs to have a conjugated term 
but uh, one can just substitute a single term since the equation is linear and when you when it is it is satisfied for each term separately right if i put xn in this case i would write in this equation only terms proportional to Uh, phase factor which depends on n. Right, that's what I wrote. So here I can change x to u, okay? Here it would be u, k, but I have to take n plus 1 into account. So it would be uh, exponent i k n plus one. I put it here. Uh, the same I would have to do with this term. Uh, right, so in total, all this terms comes with UK and with the coefficients. I collect all this, that's what I get. And here for time derivative, I just substitute omega squared. So there is an equation where I want to come. Uh, this equation is called dispersion. It is called dispersion. It, uh, I don't mean it to jump, sorry. Uh, it defines frequency of a given wave. Uh, as a function of uh, the wave vector. Okay, it's squared, we can uh, know what to do. Is to write it as a frequency. So we got dispersion law for these waves. Uh, it's um, complex, uh, in, well, in a sense that it is not a linear relation as a function of k. Uh, it is linear if k is small, if the wave lenses are bigger than the distance between, uh, between the balls. Uh, right, now I, I, what I did, I found a solution of this equation. My goal is more challenging. I would like to find all solutions. And to this end, I have to find all possible case. All possible wave vectors which can be present in this problem. That is also a um, task which is known for you. You did it in solid state physics. Uh, I believe you also Trying to my screen. No, nothing. Um, we impose, for instance, uh, uh, boundary conditions, periodic boundary conditions. Here, n is the total length, so to say, total number of balls in the chain. Uh, right, and that gives us quantized values of momentum. We did it in solid states, we did it in our course as well. <coughs> Sorry, uh, values of the uh, wave vectors are quantized. Fine. With this, we can write. Uh, and let me know the method. With this, we can um, write the general solution. For all k, we have an individual amplitude u of k. And uh, right, it's, uh, it's uh, any solution can be uh, presented 
as a set of this amplitude. Uh, fine. Do I go too slow, too fast? Let me give you binary choice. Anybody still follow me? <laughs> too fast, too slow? Okay, yeah, it's also comf comfortable for me. The only point, it's time. Uh, sir, I guess I need to accelerate a bit. Uh, why don't you stop me when you feel uh, uncomfortable with the speed? Right. From this, I want to go to continuous field because uh, yeah, most fields we regard as continuous. Um, in computer error, it doesn't matter much. We know that any continuous uh, variable we can quantize, like computer quantizes. Uh, we can consider um, everything in terms of finite elements because computers can only deal with finite elements. Uh, even color of images, all uh, video which uh, goes uh, from me to you is quantized in color for computers, there's no problem. But well, there is a general problem to understand that uh, continuous uh, limit can be seen as a uh, limit of this uh, chain, a discrete chain. Uh, let me look at similar but a bit different system. We will talk about elastic string, string and it uh, has X coordinate, continuous coordinate, and can deviate a bit in a perpendicular direction. And that deviation we call U. Uh, right, so let me get to the Redonian. Here it is, what I have here. I have momentum density. So momentum of a small piece divided by uh, the length of this piece. I have mass density. So it's clear generalization of what I uh, said about the balls. Uh, instead of discrete values of momentum, we have continuous value momentum density. And uh, this sets us uh, kinetic energy. This is potential energy. It is proportional to derivatives of uh, U. Does everybody understand why it is not proportional to U, but rather to derivatives? Uh, Right, so anybody has an idea? Why didn't I write, for instance, uh, u squared here? It would be much more convenient to deal with. Yes, yes, you're right. Uh, there is, um, one can do the following. One can just take a uniform value of U and then one understands that one just shifts the string in uh, the direction without any deformation of the string. And this shift costs no energy. Right, that's why the elastic energy 
uh, might be only proportional to derivatives. It has to be positive. It is the derivative squared. That's the general reasoning behind Hooke law. Uh, right. So with this, we can get the questions of motion again in the same way. Our equation for u, u is a coordinate now. Equation for u is uh, yeah, a variation of x with respect to density at a given point. All right, here it is. Uh, equation for momentum density. It's not momentum, it's momentum density at the moment. One can get in the same way. So here we are. And like for a uh, chain of springs, we can combine these two equations into a second order equation, which, is, which now takes the standard form of a wave equation. Wave equation, in this case for a scalar field that you doesn't have any indices, it's just a scalar. Okay, then let's go on in a similar fashion. A solution can be um, thought in a form of a plane wave with a wave vector with a frequency. You just take it, you substitute it into equation, pretty automated algebraic procedure to flex your mathematical mass constant. Uh, you got dispersion relation. And in this case, it's classical uh, sound, one can say. So indeed, uh, this uh, string is a source of sound. There are waves in this string. Uh, right, but which which uh, depends on um, okay. general solution. One finds all possible case. If one wants to keep case discrete, one assumes certain lengths of the string, one finds all possible quantized values. Uh, right, and the general solution uh, is a set or is characterized by a set of uh, amplitudes for each k of the set, we have a value of amplitude. Good, we have solved the spring, let us see. Now we want to do something less standard and something which um, looks a bit uh, senseless. But let's do it and see what are consequences. Instead of these amplitudes, complex amplitudes, we introduce new coordinates, which are usually called normal coordinates. I don't know whether normal here refers to normality. I personally don't think so, because um, what I see is a rather ugly factor in front of uh, this expression and I cannot immediately um, uh, immediately uh, understand why is it so. To your question, Saka, uh, yeah, we did impose boundary conditions in the previous uh, case. I did not uh, want to specify them too much. Uh, the boundary conditions only affect a set of quantized case. This quantized case, uh, quantized uh, values of wave vector are different, they depend on boundary conditions. We can uh, just uh, uh, 
take a strain around itself, periodic boundary conditions, so we can pinch it, or we can, uh, there are many ways one can uh, make boundary conditions on, the, on this um, uh, string. Uh, they affect only a set of distinct case, but not the existence of this set. Right, boundary conditions, they allow actually us to count case, count all possible case. That's uh, their function. Uh, coming back to coordinates, uh, normal coordinates. Uh, you just said this ugly factor, you cannot memorize it. For, at least I don't, I cannot memorize it. Uh, the problem is, the meaning of this is as follows. You take it again, you put it into the solution, and you can compute the Hamiltonian in terms of DKs rather than original, uh, original uh, variables U and uh, E. And uh, the Hamiltonian appears to be like this, only frequency of oscillations come into that. All other information like masses, like uh, elasticity constant, they are incorporated into this factor. Control question, where the elasticity constant is there in this expression. I bet it's, it is in there. Just find it. Yes, precisely. It is incorporated into omega of k because omega does depend on elasticity. Very good. Uh, normal coordinates, these. And that brings the uh, Hamiltonian to a standard form, which we're going to use. Uh, a note, if one looks at time dependence of these Ds, it's very simple, it's instructive. It's uh, just a phase factor. One can see it immediately from the equation for amplitudes. These are related to amplitudes. Right, but it's good to know that the dependence is simple. This is really something which we can memorize. Fine, so we got our sprints in a form of a set of independent oscillators. Let me make Another step, oh, not doing uh, quite good with respect to time. Um, this uh, complex uh, number, which uh, is sometimes not very convenient, let's make it real. Uh, let me introduce, again, some um, not very comprehensive factors. Let me introduce real part of the and imaginary part of D, right? And I will call them coordinate and momentum, which is not logical because they have very little to do with original coordinates and original momentum. Why it is called sir? If one takes these values, expresses these in terms of uh, P and Q, and substitutes it back into the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is reduced to this form. And that is a Hamiltonian of a particle in a parabolic potential, which is Q. And the uh, kinetic energy is expressed like this. So there's a particle moving somewhere in parabolic potential. 
So the speak you are called generalized coordinate and momentum. Again, the name comes more or less from the fact that the Hamiltonian can be reduced to this form. Don't be confused frequently. You cannot associate uh, uh, coordinate to generalized coordinate and momentum to generalized momentum, like it will be in the case of electromagnetic. Uh, fine, we have introduced all the concepts we will see for electromagnetic field, for um, uh, any arbitrary general field. On the example of uh, mechanical system, uh, chain of springs or string, let me go on before the break to Maxwell equations. This is uh, Maxwell. You might know what is your advantage with respect to Maxwell. He never took to university education. You do. Um, nevertheless, he um, kind of devoted all his li life to studying of uh, uh, electromagnetic waves. He got some um, success. And uh, in uh, at some time, he has written a book, Maxwell book, uh, about electromagnetic theory. And uh, he got fundamental equations uh, in this book. Uh, well, uh, we know four equations, but in fact, in uh, Maxwell equation, there have been uh, 52 which was uh, impossible to teach would be too much. That's why we reduce all these equations to four. Um, and well, in fact, it, just because uh, your when theory develops, one can see, uh, one does have to look at small details, uh, one uh, reduce, um, Compact the knowledge. Let me uh, let me put it like this. For instance, if one goes to relativistic world, instead of four equations, one just get one with many indices, which uh, label uh, three um, uh, dimensional space and time. But there will be only a single equation. Uh, let us recall uh, uh, the structure of these equations. Uh, right. So there are two of them which contain derivatives. And these derivatives can be put on the left hand side. And that means that those are evolution equations. Field configuration is given by electric and magnetic field, two vectors, okay, magnetic field observed the vector, not very important now. And uh, so six values in each point of uh, space and they evolve in time according to these equations. Uh, to make it complex, we also have equations which uh, do not depend on time. Divergence of uh, electric field is related to electric charge. Divergence of magnetic field is zero. 
at all times. Uh, fine, what I also need to say that these fields are responses on some, one could say action, but it's better to say sources. There are electric charges and rho is a density of electric charges and there are currents, electric currents, which enter the equation for magnetic field. Right, those are Maxwell equations and their standard form, which you have seen. Um, I guess now it's a good time to have our traditional uh, short break till uh, 9.45. You can type questions meanwhile, whatever. I, I will be around.
All right. Everybody's here. I would like to start. So, remarkable equations. Four equations, two evolution equations. They define reaction, which is electric and magnetic field, on the sources which are charge density and current density. Um, let me do now something uh, illegal. Uh, it is sure that by law we need to use and for uh, teach uh, physics in uh, international system of units uh, which is as my teachers told me is a graveyard of uh, outdated uh, physical uh, concepts well my teachers are mostly at uh, graveyard system international still exist but well it doesn't mean that uh, they were wrong uh, and uh, people uh, 
in producing system at the National Bureau, right? Um, it's much more logical, at least with respect to Maxwell equations, is to use a CGS system. And if you write these equations in this system of units, they would come a lot more transparent. So there will be no these strange uh, constants, artifacts of system intervention, no uh, magnetic uh, permutability and uh, dialectic constant of uh, vacuum. Everything will be incorporated into physical constant uh, speed of light. Right, so there will be equation for um, time derivative of magnetic field time derivative of electric field equations are the same, coefficients are different. Uh, right, so I um, uh, can memorize um, Maxwell equations in this form. I don't know about you. Um, but, well, it was just a remark, uh, a remark that, um, well, if I put it in very um, a general framework, uh, it was creator who just made the structure of uh, the world um, and the pickup equations also come from the creator. But notations in these um, equations, coefficients, well, frequently come from uh, his opponent. And uh, there can be always a confusion about this. Uh, Coefficients, but well, that's the word we live in. Good. Maxwell equations in Gauss notations. Uh, anyway, let me uh, talk, uh, uh, let me go on, let me uh, uh, remind you the facts and useful relations for this um, uh, magnetic electric field, which we're going to use right away. First, how do we detect electric and magnetic field? How we know that they exist? Uh, we do this by expecting a force. Uh, which one can, uh, well, which uh, a charged particle experiences from the fields. So there is a electrostatic force, there is a Lorentz force. Um, it interest. It is interest. It was uh, quite a discovery, which is uh, looks plain for us. Um, but it is um, interesting to understand that electric fields and magnetic fields, by themselves, they uh, uh, care energy. So there is energy density which is proportional to square roots of uh, electric and magnetic fields. So one can use capacitors and the electric coils for energy storage. Fine. Uh, let us see. I don't feel your presence. Let us check if I'm still in air. Uh, why don't you type OK in the chat? Oh, uh, I feel much better. Thank you. Uh, anyway, if you have any questions, if and if I, you think that I go too slow, too fast, please don't hesitate to give your opinion about this. Fine. Uh, first, energy density. Uh, more sophisticated uh, relation, uh, it's uh, energy flux in a given point, energy flow, which is called point in vector, right cross product of electric and magnetic field. Uh, with uh, this using Maxwell equations, it doesn't work without master equation, but with master equations, we can prove energy conservation 
or uh, electromagnetic phenomenon. The um, time derivative of energy density is, uh, well, basically divergence of pointing vector divergence of electric class. We also have uh, charge conservation. Uh, strangely enough, it can be proven from Maxwell equations, can be uh, proven by mathematical transformation. You just take, uh, let me see, divergency of uh, equation two and the uh, time derivative of equation three, combine them together, you got charge conservation. Electric fields do not enter to this combination. In principle, uh, one could imagine charge density and electric field which does not satisfy these relations. And try to give it to Maxwell equations and say, eh, get me field configuration. That doesn't work. Equations won't be able to adjust and give you solutions like uh, division by zero in computer. You are not able to find the solution of Maxwell equations if uh, current density and charge density do not satisfy this relation continuity equation. Right, these uh, things uh, are told very rarely about Maxwell equations because, uh, well, teachers don't have time. Um, I don't have time uh, either, but I, I kind of, my idea is that these details are important for your education. Uh, fine. Let us see how we can go forward. Uh, there's something specific for electromagnetism, something which uh, would not appear in other formulations of field theories. Uh, let me talk about vector and scalar potential. First of all, what is the origin of this? Um, why people uh, have introduced them at some stage? Why did they try to think about electromagnetic field in this manner? Uh, the reason is pretty mathematical at first sight. Uh, if one makes a substitution, if one presents a magnetic field as a curl of vector potential and the electric field would be gradient of electrostatic potential, which we all remember, something which one has to keep in mind that it's also time derivative of vector potential. So if one makes a substitution, that would uh, automatically reduce number of equations. So instead of uh, four, we just get two. That's it. That's a formal reason for introducing this potential. Uh, the price to pay is, uh, Enormous, I would say, because vector potentials and scalar potentials are not physical quantities. Electric and magnetic fields are physical, one can measure it, one can kind of uh, touch them, but identical physical situations can be described with different sets of vector and scalar potential is different. Uh, how will uh, we talk in a minute? Is different gauge 
choices. Do you hear the noise? You don't seem to hear a bit. Okay, it's not very hard there, but it, it, it's it's really splendid idea uh, to to spoil uh, online lectures in this way. Okay, let me go on. Um, let me I'll just give you a simple, uh, simple example of uh, the fact that they're uh, unphysical. Let me talk about electrostatic potential. Let me talk about voltage. Uh, there is no way to measure voltage and uh, kind of physical manifestation uh, is that, well, if you have a, a lead at high voltage, you can safely touch it, whatever voltage it is. And only if you touch another lead or, or if you ground yourself, you would feel some voltage difference. So only voltage differences are available for measurement and absolute volt value of voltage is just senseless. Anyway, people use it and this is a uh, kind of very frequent. Uh, again, it's a mathematical advantage. It uh, is uh, an ability to put simple in simple, for instance, we will use it in order to construct a Hamiltonian in a simple fashion. Uh, but also, it's a kind of not uh, really random, not really human invention. There are deep features of the theory which uh, kind of force the use of scalar and vector potential. One of them is um, gauge freedom. Let me talk about this, about gauge invariance. Again, I just restate the message about uh, unphysical nature of vector and scalar potentials. Uh, right, one can change these potentials vector and scalar in the following fashion. One can take any arbitrary function chi of coordinates and uh, time and put the gradient of uh, chi to vector potential, put time derivative of chi to scalar potential and that will not change the field. The fields will remain the same upon this transformation. Uh, fine, one can see it as a nuisance, uh, one can see it as a freedom. We can choose chi in the way we please. And that we, one would call fixed gauge. But we are just fixing it that in the mind, the gauge is not fixed in physical phenomena. Uh, it's like in quantum mechanics, there's some quantum mechanical function, and it is up to us in which basis we consider them. There are some um, Newton mechanics uh, and velocities, coordinates are vectors. And it is up to us to choose coordinate system for these vectors. So there is a kind of intrinsic freedom which is uh, incorporated in all this physical phenomenon at or, uh, phenomena at different levels. And uh, there is such a freedom for electromagnetic fields. The freedom which is expressed by gauge invariance.
Right. Uh, this gauge invariance of electric fields is uh, can be uh, easily related to gauge invariance of Schrodinger equations. I don't do it now because we mostly talk about classical physics. But we will discuss this. There was no noise. Uh, let us see. Uh, again, I don't feel much of your presence. Please uh, help me. Please type something into the chat. Hi. <laughs> very good. Thank you very much. Right, so let me now take two examples of gadgets which we gonna use when I'm talking about electromagnetic field. Um, this is uh, called Lorentz gauge. Right, and uh, anyway, gauge is a constraint, uh, something that uh, um, some extra equation which uh, uh, vector potential and um, scalar potential should obey. And uh, this has been chosen like this. Uh, one can see that this is um, um, kind of wave-like. It contains uh, velocity of uh, light. Uh, and also it's complex. One can show that it, is, it satisfies a relativistic symmetry. It is it's called Lorentz invariance. Let me pay attention to the difference. It's not a misspelling, uh, as uh, or uh, most Dutchmen would uh, would put T here, right? Lawrence was was great Dutch scientist, but uh, Lawrence was a distant personality. He was a Dane to start with. So it's uh, kind of uh, very intriguing that Lorentz gauge is Lorentz invariant. Anyway, uh, this is a gauge which is uh, well suitable for relativistic problems. When we really have configurations of field uh, and um, of fields which are spread with a speed of light, uh, fine. If one makes use of this relation, the Maxwell equations do remain in master equations. We remember that by introducing scalar potential and vector potential, we get from four equations to two equations. Two equations remaining, they just become, well, easy to memorize. So there was a separate equation for scalar potentials and uh, for uh, vector potential. Uh, right, and this uh, square here, it is an operator, which is called the Lambertian. An operator, which is a wave operator. It contains second derivative of, of time and second derivative of coordinate. Is that what we have already seen in one of the first examples in this lecture when we talk about a string? Fine, Lorentz gauge. Uh, it would have, been, would have been most logical choice, but the point we are not really relativistic beings. Um, that's why uh, a convenient choice to for non-relativistic problems 
is to put this on A. Uh, no, no, I, 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 it is all in system international now. Uh, right, so it's uh, it, all these uh, arc decay efficiency. Uh, uh, let, 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 let us see how can I see it. This is a signature of System International. Uh, but uh, it, well, it disappears here because I put C squared. What was that? No, not that. So no. I obey the law. I do it in all system international. Uh, good. Uh, Coulomb gauge, uh, specific for non relativistic uh, problems. And that means that uh, A is diverging less as magnetic field is. There's no divergence of magnetic field. There's no source of magnetic field, nor monopoles. The same we assume for vector potential. Coulomb gauge, and uh, right, uh, since we are in different gauge, Maxwell equations uh, look different. And I look at the first equation. It's very simple, it defines electrostatic potential uh, from a charge. And uh, it is uh, interesting to notice that it has no retardation. So let us see, this is charge, this is me. And if I If charge has moved, I gonna see the potential change instantly. And this is precisely the technique to communicate with a speed, uh, with a uh, zero speed to overcome light barrier as far as information transfer is concerned. That's why we reach uh, distant stars and all that. No, I, I'm mocking, of course. Uh, nothing, no information or physical quantity can break a uh, light barrier. Uh, so what is the, why is it, sir? why the potential can change instantly, at least according to this equation. Who can answer this question? The question is, why do we see this apparent uh, breakthrough of the light? It's again about uh, the fact that uh, we don't deal with physical quantities here. There is indeed a change of electrostatic potential which is instant, but we cannot feel this change. We need to compute the fields electric field, magnetic field, and they're retarded. If I move the charge, the change of fields, instant change of fields would be zero because electric fields cannot propagate uh, faster 
the speed of light. Good. Coulomb gauge. We will use it. Um, let me go further on. And uh, okay, I can be planned. The rest of the plan of the lecture will be boring. It will be about presenting all that as oscillator sets. Again, once again, we need it. Uh, we have it. We, we have to have it. Sorry, uh, as a preparation for quantization. There are no other way to quantize, for instance, electric field. Uh, right, so we will so we will present Max equation as an oscillator set, and in order not to keep it too abstract, we will finish with a simple example of a single oscillator. Fine. Let uh, me find all solutions of Maxwell equation. Need to simplify it a bit first. I um, Consider electromagnetic field in vacuum. There's absolutely no charges. Uh, sir, I can, under these circumstances, I can put electrostatic potential to zero. Right. I will use Coulomb gauge. Then, since there's no electrostatic potential, I have a separate equation for vector potential. It's quite convenient, separate equation for all vector components. If I know the solution, I know the solutions for magnetic field and electric field, just to substitute solutions for vector potential. Good. So I need to concentrate on vector potential satisfying this equation. Good. Uh, anyway, uh, if you want to know all solutions, we want to introduce a set of discrete uh, wave vectors. We really want to count all possible values of wave vectors, making sure that we don't miss a single value. We want to know all solutions. To show for that, let us assume some simple boundary conditions, periodic boundary conditions are of that kind. I'll say a large volume with the lens L, and we assume periodicity of Maxwell equations over. Okay. Partial solution, you know that. It's just uh, a plane wave. A plane wave, which has a wave vector, which we have quantized, has frequency, and the relation between frequency and k is what you know. Here we have again speed of light. So just like the magnetic waves of light. Uh, very good. Then at a given k, a partial solution for vector potential reads as follows. Good, here I have A, it's a vector. Let me put an arrow for the time being. Uh, right, there is a vector of plane wave. And I have AK, which is amplitude of the wave. Next to it, I have a vector. And now I notice that this vector has an index, which appears here. So what is the vector? This vector determines a polarization of a wave. First of all, this vector must be perpendicular to a vector in which uh, the wave is propagated to a wave vector. So it has only two independent components. That's why there are two possible 
polarizations. It's up to us to choose these vectors characterizing the polarization as far as these vectors are orthogonal. Good, so what we have found, for each k we have two solutions corresponding to different polarization indices. Let me show vector here. Uh, right, so A is uh, real, that's why I have to have uh, two conjugated uh, waves. Um, complex conjugated waves. All right, that's a partial solution. Vector of polarization, which is very important when we talk, when we start talking about the radiation, will become essential. Uh, anything else I want to say? Any questions at this point? We have found a partial solution of Maxwell equation and we recall polarization vectors of electromagnetic waves. Okay. Okay. Uh, now let us make a general solution. Oh. We know that the equations uh, are linear. So we will uh, get uh, all possible solutions by linear superposition of partial solutions at all case of polarization. So it is a summation over all case, over all polarizations. And if I want to be consistent here, I would put uh, A of k partial amplitudes, but I would like to make already a small uh, step forward. I introduce normal coordinates instead of a k. That's why I have this ugly coefficient. In system international, it is especially ugly, but uh, yeah, it would be ugly in any system. Uh, that coefficient, it's uh, almost impossible to memorize, uh, but well, he, he, it is frequently needed when we, and when we talk about field temperatures of electromagnetic field, we will certainly recall it. Okay, what is advantage of this? Advantage of normal fish uh, of normal coordinates is this. Well, again, uh, the same as for uh, string. It gives rise to simple representation of the Hamiltonian. How to get it practically? One can take um, expression for the total energy of the field. Well, this is integral over space over energy densities or squares of electric and magnetic field in each point coming into the expression. Now, what we do, we do quite some algebra which I don't want to give here. It is uh, straightforward by tedious. So each B of R, for instance, we write as a sum over all possible case dK 
with some coefficients. The same we do for electric field. So, in fact, substituting it, well, as a p squared, so in any case, I would have to have double sum over two k's. But after integration, if you have different case, in uh, wave factors uh, for different waves. You integrate this and uh, let us see, why don't you give me an answer? What is this integral? Yes, sir, if k is not equal to k prime, it is zero. Otherwise, it is uh, delta peak k minus k prime. That's why instead of double sum, we have a single sum, sum over all k's, sum over corresponding d's, and coefficients are just frequencies of corresponding field oscillators. All right, the same game one can do for uh, uh, pointing vector for energy flux. In this case, one relates uh, the flux um, with the uh, wave vector in a certain direction. Good, but most important for us is this uh, expression for Hamiltonian that justifies the choice of D, normal coordinates we made. Uh, right, there are properties which we have already seen uh, when we talk about strings. Time dependence is very simple, trivial, easy to remember, just phase factor. From complex these we can make uh, real, two real variables for each oscillator, generalized coordinate, generalized momentum, and with this we can write the Hamiltonian in a standard form. So it does not very much of information about electric field, but that was the goal, in fact, which we wanted to achieve. We would like to uh, be able to put any field to a single standard form when all details are incorporated in concrete form of these uh, apparatus and into oscillating frequencies. Good, again, to remind, having classical Hamiltonian means that we have uh, time-dependent equations, simple equations, which we can solve, and they are, in fact, equivalent to Maxwell equations. Fine, uh, that sets a kind of global goal, now we know how to quantize uh, electromagnetic field in vacuum. Um, what is a kind of practical calculation? I want to do is to count the number of oscillators. Uh, let us uh, recognize that the number of oscillators per small volume in K-space. 
So we take a small volume somewhere uh, centered at some point in K space, and that has dimensions delta K X, X delta K Y, and third dimension is delta K Z, right? So we look at this small volume in K space, and we just recall quantization condition for the momentum. So it is uh, quantized in instead of two pi divided by L for each of three dimensions. And we also have uh, two, which comes from polarizations. There are two polarization sets for each quantized vector. So uh, finally, we obtain this. So here we have normalization volume, volume uh, in coordinate space. Here we have, in fact, volume in K space, and there's a coefficient. Uh, we can also compute the number of oscillators per frequency interval. How to get from this expression to this one? Well, it's just geometry. We need to compute a volume in K space, a volume of a difference of two spheres. So this sphere in K space bounds um, frequencies with omega plus uh, d omega and that sphere bounds it up to omega. So there's a spherical segment very thin. We need to compute its, its volume. Once it's done, we arrive to this equation. So number of oscillators per frequency interval is proportional to the volume of the system and is proportional to the square root of frequency. We are going to use it in the future. Uh, good, there are some, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm almost out of time. But let me make it perhaps uh, uh, several minutes longer. Let me talk about single oscillator. I guess the simpler exa is example, the better, at least to me. So let me recall uh, what we know about the simplest oscillator, LC circuit. We just connect capacitor and inductor and there are oscillations. There is an energy. Here it is. This is capacitive energy. It depends on voltage, which is at this capacitor. And there is inductor energy, which depends on the current, which goes through inductor. Equations of motion, well, one can just derive it from circuit theory. So, uh, for instance, if one knows current, one knows the time derivative of charge and the capacitor, which is related to voltage. And for capacitance, we have induction law. Induction law means that if one changes the current in this inductor, one gets the voltage signal. All right, again, like in Maxwell equations, one can see this as evolution equations. That defines uh, time derivative of current, that defines time derivative of, uh, of the charge. Right, solving these equations will give us frequency at which this oscillates. That's all you know. Whether you remember it, uh, it's another story. Who remembers that? Who 
who has at least some reminiscence about uh, studying LC circuit. Good, 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 very good. So now let's take what you know, what you remember, and let us uh, do the stuff we have done with electromagnetic field, with spring, with everything. We want to reduce uh, the Hamiltonian to uh, the Hamiltonian to standard form. Introducing generalized momentum, generalized coordinate. Okay, uh, that seemed to be a rather vague task, but it's very simple. Let us just assume that momentum is proportional to current, coordinate is proportional to voltage. Then uh, we can find a coefficient of proportionality just by equating, for instance, kinetic energy and uh, inductor energy. Good. That immediately gives us generalized uh, coordinates. This is for uh, momentum. This is for coordinate. Fine. We have these generalized coordinates. It means that we can immediately write down normal coordinates here. This uh, strangely looking complex number when we have lots of ugly square roots, but well, don't, don't worry. They all are there for a good reason. Fun, we've done it. We have quantized uh, the simplest oscillator uh, and um, thereby I'm ready to finish the lecture. I don't have any more slides. Any questions? Any questions to conclude? Your impression may be. I don't have much reactions or for some time, for indefinite time, we will uh, go on in this uh, format. I will record this lecture, I'm recording this lecture, I will set it to YouTube soon. Uh, any comments are helpful because we all teachers of this technical university are still experimenting, looking for a most optimal system of online education. And uh, all right, I'm pleased with your positive reaction. Thank you very much. The lecture is over. I will uh, see you soon. Uh, there, will, or, there will be a presentation, uh, problem solving session on Monday concerning your homework. And uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I bet you remember there was a homework deadline coming. So thank you very much. I'm ending this meeting. Bye.